Welcome to our eighth prophecy seminar. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we dig into one more story in the book of Daniel, we pray that your spirit will be with us. Help us to understand the lessons that you have here for us and help us to develop a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've gone over three seminars now without being able to be together at the church. We covered Daniel 3 with the fiery furnace. We covered Daniel 4 with Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. We looked at Daniel 5 with Belshazzar's drunken party and the handwriting on the wall and the destruction of Babylon. And during those times, our special features were on Turkmenistan and that mysterious golden statue that turned slowly. They were about Cyrus, Cyprus with its churches and mosques and convents, the cedars of Lebanon and those carvings that Nebuchadnezzar had made on the side of the mountain. And all of those are on the church's YouTube channel. If you haven't had a chance to see them yet, you can go there and look at those prophecy seminars. But even if you haven't had a chance to see them, it's okay, you still should be able to get a blessing from this one. You know the stories that we've covered and you know the story that we covered last time. So let's go ahead with our quiz. True or false? True or false, the act that brought down the wrath of God in ancient Babylon was the use in pagan worship of the vessels that had been consecrated to God. Well, that's true. Number two, true or false, when Daniel was called to in interpret the writing on the wall, he was unable to interpret the writing. That's false. The other wise men couldn't interpret it, but Daniel did. Number three, true or false, the book of Revelation indicates that Babylon will mix truth and error together and still profess to be Christian. That's true. Number four, God asks his people not to leave Babylon, but to stay in it and reform it. That's false. God calls his faithful people out of spiritual end-time Babylon. And number five, true or false, spiritual adultery is an illicit relationship that combines false worship with the worship of God. That's true. Last month, we saw Daniel read the writing on the wall. Babylon was conquered, Belshazzar was killed, Cyrus made Darius king, and then Cyrus left Babylon. Today, we're going to be looking at the last story in Daniel's life. It's something that happened while he was working with King Darius. Before we do that, I want to spend a few minutes looking at what Cyrus was doing during that time. He had left Darius to be king of Babylon, and he'd gone off somewhere. So during the time of this story in Daniel 6, Daniel and Darius were still in Babylon. But Cyrus had gone to what's now Turkmenistan. You may remember that we looked at Turkmenistan a few months ago when we were studying Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. We saw pictures of the spotlessly clean white marble city of Ashgabat. We saw the giant book that had been written by the president that opens once a year in the park as part of a large celebration. We saw the golden image of the president that turned slowly so that it always faced the sun. In Bible times, the area that's now Turkmenistan was an important juncture on the ancient silk roads from India and China to Europe. If Cyrus was going to maintain an empire, he had to be able to control that silk road. So he went there to what's now Turkmenistan and built a small but highly fortified city. So I thought I'd show you a few pictures, modern day pictures, of the area where Cyrus went when he left Darius and Daniel in Babylon. We'll start with the very busy public market on the edge of the capital city of Ashgabat. 
It may not be quite like the days of the ancient Silk Road during the time of Cyrus, but people still come in from all over the surrounding region to sell the things that they've made or grown or purchased and brought here to this market. Actually, I wish we had a market like that near us. Doesn't that produce look wonderful? And those watermelons, they claim they raise the best watermelons in the world, and I almost agree with them. They said in the olden days they would pack those watermelons into lead boxes and put those lead boxes on the backs of camels and take them hundreds of miles, even as far away as Babylon and maybe even to Jerusalem, the lead in the boxes somehow helped to keep the watermelons from spoiling on those long trips. Today, they just fly them places and, and they dry them. They have a lot of dried melon there, but I think they must use it all locally because I don't remember ever seeing dried melon in the stores here from Turkmenistan. Look at all those dried nuts and fruits and bags and bags of various spices and herbs. You can almost imagine what the Silk Road, the ancient Silk Road, must have been like. Here are a couple of girls working in the bakery. Many people would wave and smile at us and want their picture taken. Sunglasses probably weren't available in Cyrus's time, but they're very popular now. And even Coca-Cola advertises there in Turkmenistan. There's a kaleidoscope of colors and textures in the market. These little hats are usually worn by Muslim men and the carpets of all types were for sale there in the market. The hanging up carpets are woven and the ones on the ground here in this picture are felt carpets. They're not as quite as fancy as the woven ones, but they still are beautiful. And I'll show you in a, in a few minutes how some of them were made. As we left, we saw people sitting by the sides of the road trying to sell their things. They probably didn't want to pay the fee to be inside the market. And soon we were driving through a mountainous region. And then not far out of Ashgabat, we came to this beautiful park. You see, the president was very health conscious. And he claimed he was worried that too many of his government ministers were overweight and unhealthy. So he built this, or had built, this 22-mile stairway up across a section of the mountain range, and he required all of his government ministers to walk it once a year. He would see them off, and then he would helicopter to the other end and welcome them when they arrived after 22 grueling miles over the mountains in the hot sun. As you travel further and further from the city, you pass vast fields of cotton, much of it still picked by hand. We also saw plenty of trucks and American-made SUVs and minivans, but there were also many other means of conveyance. You see the, hand, the handmade sidecar on this motorcycle? And here's a donkey pulling a wagon, and here's a donkey with a saddle, but I almost think I would rather walk than ride on that saddle. At one point, looking out across the cotton fields, we could see some sort of ruins in the distance. Our guide said, that's part of the ancient city of Mer. And then they showed us a map. On this map, you can see four successive cities that were built at this particular site. The first one, the small circle, is the one that was built by Cyrus. And it might look small on the map, but it sure didn't look small as we drove up to it a few minutes later. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there in the picture, about in the center, down at the bottom of the wall, is a white tour bus. It was a huge tour bus, but it looks like a tiny toy next to those massive walls. And here are some people standing on top of what is left of one of the towers that used to be along the wall. 
when Cyrus built this, it had massive walls with flat tops that they could run chariots on. Through the more than 2,000 years since then, the walls have gradually crumbled, but they're still pretty amazing. And this view of, this is a view of what remains of the walls, the wall of one of the larger cities. The walls were smaller, but the city was larger. In the modern city nearby, there's also a market. And again, I was very impressed by the friendliness of the people and by the amazing variety of produce that was available. The countryside from ancient Merv to the border is mostly desert. But we did see a few flocks of sheep. We saw some cows, sometimes even a camel walking along the road or a group of camels out trying to find something to eat. Here, Gary Krause, my boss, had asked the driver to stop so he could get a picture of a baby camel. I took a picture of Gary and the baby camel, but I stayed at a distance because I could see the mother camel watching carefully what was going on. We passed some rivers and some canals, and wherever they were, there was life. And then we arrived at the village of our tour guide. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the people were friendly, and I would have loved to have been able to speak Russian or Turkmen and talk with them. Well, most of them were friendly. This little girl didn't seem too sure of us. They showed us some of their gardens and the fruit trees. These are pomegranate trees. They raised food for themselves and for their animals. They also raised cash crops like broom corn that they could make into brooms to sell. We noticed that almost everyone had a satellite dish. They took us into one of the homes where they were making one of these felt carpets that I showed you earlier. They would, they would sort and clean and dye the wool and then carefully lay it out in patterns on these reed mats. Then they would roll the mat up tightly and dip it over and over again in boiling water. That would make the wool shrink and make it into a thick felt mat. The whole process took them about two weeks. Here's a picture of one that was recently finished. Now I asked the lady how much she would sell it for. She gave me a price that was about $9. $9 for two weeks worth of work. I paid her without even bargaining and she probably thought I was crazy. These handmade carpets are not just for decoration. They use them in every room of their house. And by the way, in that part of Turkmenistan, it's often the youngest child or especially the youngest son that gets the parents home. He in exchange is expected not to move away He's supposed to stay there living in the house or in the house next door and take care of his aging parents. It's felt that the youngest one is probably going to live longer and may actually have more energy and be able to, to be there. So he's the one that's going to inherit the house. Sorry about that, I had to get a little drink. We, here's our guide's family. Let's get this going again, there we go. Here's our guide's family watching television in their family room and getting ready for their supper. Our meal was in the next room and it was quite a meal. We sat on carpets and talked and laughed together and shared. Our guide laid on the carpet and on some pillows, much like Jesus and his disciples would have done. And after we had been sharing food together, then our guide was comfortable to begin sharing deeper things with us. He told us that one day he got a package in the mail from a tour group he had led a few weeks before. It contained a Bible. He was thrilled. But the very next day, the KGB or CID knocked on his door and said, we know you got a Bible in the mail, and you know that's not allowed. 
he said, oh, I'm sorry, but, but I didn't order it. I didn't know it was coming. Those people just sent it to me and it came. Well, they said, what are you doing with it? He said, I, I told them I was a teacher and I needed to know about the various ancient writings of antiquity, but not to worry, he said. I told them, I'm not reading it. I'm just looking at it. Oh, okay, they said, but don't start causing any problems with it. Then he lowered his voice almost to a whisper, and he said, I'm comparing the prophets in the Bible with the prophets in the Quran. I was amazed and was praying in my heart, oh Lord, as this man compares the prophets, may he learn to know you as more than a prophet. But he wasn't finished. He told us the Turkmen language had only been a written language for about 10 years. Before that, it had just been a spoken language. And then he got up and walked over to his bookcase. He glanced out the windows and doors as though we were making sure nobody was coming or looking and slowly reached under a pile of magazines and books and brought out a tiny, tiny book. His face beamed with a mixture of joy and excitement and awe as he said, this is a Bible in Turkmen. I said, wow, and it's only been 10 years since Turkmen was even a written language. Uh, can you buy Bibles inside Turkmenistan? Again, he lowered his voice to a whisper and he said, not legally, but there are some. You know, I had a hard time sleeping that night. Maybe it was partly jet lag, partly seeing how God is at work, even in a place where it seemed like we couldn't see anything going on. I was praying for our tour guide, a, a well-read and studied man, a teacher. There in the land where Cyrus went during Daniel's time, the voice of the prophet Daniel and the rest of the Bible is quietly making itself heard. And I would urge you to pray for Turkmenistan as well and the millions of other people around the world who don't have such easy access to the Bible as we have. May God somehow still reach out and touch their lives. So let's go back and start reading the story of Daniel and the lion's den in Daniel 6. Daniel 6, starting in verse 1, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Now remember, Daniel was a pretty major figure in the previous empire. On the night that Babylon had been destroyed, Belshazzar had made Daniel the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And when a new king would come in and conquer an area, he usually killed all of the major figures from the previous kingdom. It says something about Cyrus and Darius that they didn't do that. And it says something about Daniel that he was soon considered trustworthy enough not only to be left alive, but to be made the chief administrator in the entire empire. Let's go on, starting in verse 4. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. I just want to pause there for a minute. If someone were to dig through our tax records or other business dealings, would they come away saying, wow, they are totally honest and always trustworthy. Let's go on, verse five. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. 
So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, we're in agreement that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. Poor Daniel. Over and over, we've seen him and his friend, his three friends caught up in controversy over obedience and worship. And now in his old age, just when it seems like the pressure's finally off, just when he's finally being respected and trusted by the king, the trouble hits again. These scheming princes and advisors or governors couldn't find any fault with Daniel. And they really didn't care anything about the reputation of the king. They just wanted Daniel out of the way. They probably didn't like it that he was always honest and hardworking. They wanted one of themselves in that role, someone who would wink and turn their head and let them benefit themselves from time to time. And they knew that the only way to get rid of Daniel would be to somehow force him to choose between obedience to the king and obedience to God. If they could make him choose, they were quite sure that Daniel would choose obedience to God. So the king was tricked, and he signed the law with immediate effect. You know the story, but let's go on reading it, starting in verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they said, to, told the king, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Now, I want to ask you, is it okay to pray in your closet? Of course it is. Jesus even said that there are times to go in your closet and shut the door and pray. Daniel could have gone into his closet and prayed any time he wanted to, and maybe he did from time to time. But God has commanded us to worship only him. We are not to pray to idols or to people, only to God. So when the, king command, when the king's command ordered that people were not to pray to any God but only to him, Daniel couldn't let it appear like he had quit praying to God. So he kept on doing what he had been doing before, praying by his window three times a day. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew those men were trying to get rid of him. He knew about the decree. He knew for sure what the result would be. He would be tossed into a pit filled with half-starved lions. Now remember, these stories in the first part of Daniel are illustrations of what will happen to God's people at the end of time. Daniel's three friends had been ordered to pray to an image. And now Daniel was ordered not to pray to the true God. Both were wrong, and in both cases they refused the commands of the king. We need to obey the rulers in everything we possibly can, but if their command goes against what God commands, then we need to have such a strong relationship with Jesus that we're willing to disobey their command no matter what. Daniel obviously had a relationship with God. 
And in this time of crisis, he calmly went ahead doing what he knew was right. You can almost picture these evil rulers gleefully rushing into the king and trying to keep straight faces while they reminded him that he had signed a decree. And then they told him that the highest official in the land was ignoring him and had broken the law openly and defiantly. Let's go on with verse 14. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your Majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles, so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep all that night. Poor King Darius. He realized too late that he had been tricked by these scheming men. Now he was going to lose the only man in the kingdom that he could fully trust. How is it with you and I? Do the people around us know that they can trust us to be totally honest and fair in all we do? Does our relationship with Jesus show through to the people around us? If, if we were accused of being followers of Jesus, could they find enough evidence to convict us? You know, it seems that the king went personally with the guards to arrest Daniel. He didn't just send them to do it by themselves. He went with them and went with them to the lion's den. And as he left Daniel, he expressed the hope that Daniel's God might somehow deliver him. Still, the king didn't have the relationship with God that Daniel did. And while Daniel seems to have been at peace, the king was not. Now, I love these next few verses, starting in verse 19. It says, very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. What a powerful testimony. Daniel had been faithful, and God had miraculously delivered him. But just like his three friends who were thrown into the fiery furnace, Daniel was faithful to God without knowing whether he would live or die. He obeyed, no matter what might happen as a result. Do we have that kind of relationship with Jesus? Do we trust him enough to do what he says, no matter what the results might be? The last few verses show us that this was indeed a miracle. It wasn't a case of the lions just not being hungry that day. It's Daniel 6 and verse 24 then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. 
He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Because Daniel had such a strong relationship with God, God was able to bless him and use him as a powerful witness from one king to another, to another, to another. The Apostle John also had such a close relationship with Jesus that he was faithful even when they tried to kill him by dipping, dipping him in boiling oil. He was faithful even when he was beaten and exiled to a lonely rocky island with the worst of the criminals. And look what John says about the importance of a relationship with Jesus. John 17 and verse 3. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Okay, so that's how we have eternal life, by knowing God. But how do we get to know God? Well, how do we get to know anyone? We get to know them by spending time with them. You can't get to know someone very well by just brief encounters. What did our chapter in Daniel say that he did each day? It was in verse 10. It says that he prayed three times a day. These weren't brief, momentary, thank you for the food, amen, type of prayers. He took time from his day to talk with God and to listen to what God might say to him. And by listen, I don't just mean the visions and dreams that he had. Daniel listened to God the same way you and I can listen to God today. Later, we'll get to Daniel 9, but we need to skip over there for just a minute and look at what Daniel did in addition to praying. Daniel 9 and verse 2. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. Daniel not only prayed, he spent time reading and studying God's word. And the Apostle Paul tells young Timothy the same thing in 2 Timothy 3.15. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. You see, studying the scriptures, the Bible, the word of God, helps us to develop a trusting relationship with Jesus. And Paul goes on, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Some translations say that studying God's word makes us complete or perfect. The word, the original word, means mature, prepared, developed, equipped. As we take time to study God's word, we develop, we grow, we mature, we become equipped in our relationship with Jesus. Any Christian who's serious about being ready for the closing scenes of this earth's history will be spending significant time today developing a relationship with Jesus through Bible study and prayer. As we've looked at this story of Daniel, I hope his example has inspired you to do the same. And if it's your desire to spend quality and quantity time with Jesus so that you can develop this relationship and be prepared for the last days, would you stand with me wherever you are as we pray? Dear Lord, thank you that we have the Bible so available to us in many different translations. We don't have to hide it under things. We can read it any time we want. And Lord, I pray that we will do like Daniel, that we will spend more time reading and praying and talking with you, that we will develop a relationship that will help us to stand no matter what temptations or commands come against what you say, that we will be faithful to you in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Next month is going to be our ninth seminar. We'll begin to look carefully at Daniel chapter 7. It's about a vision that Daniel had regarding a series of strange beasts and a little horn. And speaking of beasts, we're going to have a special feature on Kenya next month. We'll see some baby beasts and some full-grown ones and some other things from Kenya. That'll be on July 25 of this year. And I would love to send you the lessons that you're missing, the review lessons that we used to hand out after each session. We are still in sort of a lockdown and this would be a good time to spend extra time studying and reviewing. I think that the last lesson we handed out was number four, but you might have even missed some of the others. And if you would email me or text me, I'd be happy to send you those lessons so that you'll have them and can be spending this time doing like Daniel did, studying and developing a relationship with Jesus. May God be with you as you spend time with him and his word.